when someone accidentally threw away the school play costumes, Oh no! Replacements were shipped with FedEx, and with picture proof of delivery, everyone could focus on the perfect opening night. FedEx, where now meets next. For residential delivery only. This episode may contain explicit language. Welcome to Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast for Monday, November 27th, the Toddler Takedown Edition. I'm Jamila Lemieux, a writer, contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column, and a mom to Naima, who's 10, and we live in Los Angeles. I'm Zach Rosen. I make another podcast that's called The Best Advice Show, and I'm dad to Noah, who's six, and Ami, who's three. We live in Detroit. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the homeschool and family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 11, Oliver, who's nine, and Teddy, who's seven. We live in Tokyo, Japan. On today's show, we have a very interesting question about a three-year-old who is a brawler. He hits his older brother, he hits his mom, he hits his dad. They're trying to get him to hang up his gloves, so to speak, before someone gets hurt. But so far, no dice. We've got some suggestions to help curb the behavior. Then we'll move on to a round of recommendations and we'll close out the show with a few letters from you. See you back in a moment. Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. Your kids ask questions like, what's a recession? Or why do we have to pay rent? Maybe you wonder about these things too. That's why Million Bazillion, the Webby winning podcast from Marketplace, is perfect for you and your little ones. Each week we explore big questions about money so kids and parents can learn together and have fun along the way. Listen to Million Bazillion wherever you get your podcasts. We're back and ready for today's listener question, which actually came from a listener who sent in one of the most talked about questions last year. We'll link to the episode in the show notes. But all that to say, if you've ever written into the show, just know you can send as many letters as you want. You're not restricted to just one. Okay, without any further ado, here's the question. Dear mom and dad, my three-year-old is a brawler. He's quick to hit and much like a Rottweiler, he rarely backs down and only hits harder like when he gets into fights with his six-year-old brother. Despite the age difference, he's able to hold his own physically with his older brother using his aggression and single-mindedness to make up for his weaker strength. I've advised his brother, who is more gentle and still protective of his brother, that he's allowed to hit back. I feel that if my three-year-old can see the consequences of hitting others is to get hit back, that may show him that getting physical won't solve his problems. We also do timeouts in the garage where he can be isolated as punishment. What's challenging is that he never seems to back down. Even when his stronger brother hits him harder, he seems to keep punching. I'm also freaking out every time I see him hit his mom, as I was raised that boys should not hit girls. It's also unsettling when I have to physically restrain my three-year-old because I'm constantly trying to use just enough strength and not completely manhandle him. So what tools and strategies can I use to show my three-year-old treasure that it's wrong to hit and punch before and after episodes? And how about ways to cool him down during an episode? Oh, boy. This oh boy. is a tough one. Mother um, of all the boys, Elizabeth Newcamp. I know. Yes. And guys, we have we have definitely had a lot of hitting (laughs) there's been so much hitting in this house um to deal with so uh, there's so much in this letter i want to start with what they're doing now um because that needs to stop uh it is a big mistake i think to let your kids like sanction hit each other like to say when your brother hits you hit him back Um, I know you think it's teaching consequences, but I truly believe it is teaching it is okay to hit when you are angry because it's really hard for a three-year-old to understand, hey, don't hit, but it's okay for him to hit if you hit. Like you're making Mm -hmm. him mad and he's going to hit. I I think it's really important that the family rule is essentially we do not hit. We do not use physical like violence when we are angry. And that is across the board. The best thing you can do is um, I, I think in regards to the other son, the best thing you can do is have him 
walk away, remove himself to safety, and kind of repeat whatever your family line is going to be, which is like, we don't hit when we're angry. I'm going to remove myself. And then you giving him praise for removing himself from the situation, from going somewhere safe, right, for dealing with his anger in a different way. Um, That needs to be the family policy. I also want to say that isolating this three-year-old is also not going to fix your problem because your three-year-old is hitting because they don't know what to do with the way they're feeling when they're angry. They are so angry in their body that they are using like physical actions to show you how angry they are. And so by saying, go sit by yourself, there's no processing of these feelings. And and I think that the only way really to help a three-year-old that's hitting is to have them be okay with this anger feeling and know what to do with it when they have it. Um, and there's there's a bunch of strategies. I, I think there could be other things going on here, but I want to say there is a um, lovely Instagram account podcast. They have the whole thing called Big Little Feelings. They deal with so much of this in depth. Go go there. Watch a couple of videos. They have an entire series on hitting. Uh, I think you need to be in the frame of mind of calm and collected when the hitting happens to be able to say to this three-year-old, like, we don't hit when we're angry. I know that you're feeling angry. It is okay to feel angry. It is not okay to hit. Um, For us, the big thing was that we couldn't really stop the hitting behavior right away. The two boys that really struggled with this, it was like that was so ingrained that step one was like, you can't hit another person, but you can hit this giant squishmallow or you mm-hmm. can hit this mm-hmm. pillow and we're going to mm-hmm. have something in every room that you can hit. And so when you feel angry, we're going to hit this. Um, and that might have looked like when we were angry, narrating, I'm feeling really angry. I'm going to go hit this pillow um, or you know, hey, I see you're feeling angry. Let me bring you the pillow to hit. So starting with just, it's okay to feel angry. We have get to make a choice with what we do with our behavior. This is what we can do with it. So I I think that is kind of a good place to start. I agree. I think this idea of saying like, it's totally legit that you feel like you want to hit, that is very normal. But, But the hitting is what we have to uh, curb. I think I think that's really smart. And also, I'm curious if you've noticed, Dad, like a pattern around when your son is violent. Is it like, you know, before dinner? Could he be hungry? Could he be tired? Um, could he be like exhausted from whatever routine they're, they're part of? Um, I think maybe starting to maybe chart when and where he's exhibiting this behavior might give you some clues as to how to curb it before it's happening like some some parental detective work um of course it could also be completely random and and that might not be as helpful um i often think about daniel tiger particularly Mm. season one episode four um which you can find online or on the pbs kids app when daniel and katarina And their friends are working on, I mean, the whole show's subtext is like the whole series is about what to do with our feelings, as is Mr. Rogers. But this one in particular is about um, what we do when we're feeling mad. And if you're looking for a kind of, you know, indirect way to to talk to them about feelings, I can't recommend Daniel Tiger enough. There's a song that we still sing in in our family. Even my six-year-old sings it. When you feel so mad that you want to roar, take a step back and count to four. Count to four. Yeah, you know it, Jamila. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's uh, essential essential listening and viewing. Um, I think all of Daniel Tiger is absolutely excellent. Those were some of my thoughts beyond uh, my co-signing of Elizabeth's. Yeah, um, I co-sign you both definitely not okay to let the six-year-old hit him back um you're just confirming that it's okay to hit when you're upset you know um or that there's ever a reason to hit somebody and you don't want to do that um 
I'm curious about the timeouts in the garage. Uh, yeah, what state do you live in? I was wondering. Like, is anyone else in the garage with him? Is he there completely by himself? Just because I know a lot of garages can be dangerous places, you know, mm. for kids. And I would imagine, like, someone who's upset already, you know, maybe not sitting down and just cooling out, but instead tinkering around with what they can get their hands into. So maybe just something to think about. There may be a better place in the house for a timeout other than the garage. Again, unless someone is going in there with him. Um, I would just also imagine that being, you know, in a part of the house that's like separate from the rest of the house, alone from everyone, could be a little scary for a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, just letting him know that it's okay to have these feelings, but that it's about how he expresses them. You know, I understand that you're angry. It's okay to be angry. I get angry. Dad gets angry. Mom gets mm -hmm. angry. We all get angry, you know, um, but we just can't use our hands and there should be consequences, you know, um, there should always be a timeout. There should always be, okay, well, I'm not going to play with you right now. You know, if his brother's playing a game with him and he hits his brother, packs up the game and walks away. You know, if he's doing something with mom or dad, they say, okay, we're not doing this anymore. Um, if he was looking forward to watching a show or having some dessert, you take that away. You know, like there has to be a reaction every time it happens. You know, it's not something that you can just ignore, but definitely not letting the brother hit back because that really jumped out at me like, oh no. I know. I, I think your um, thing about a consequence is so important and it it needs to be a consequence, not a punishment, which you, mm -hmm. I think, described perf like perfectly. Coming up with what that's going to be beforehand, I also think is important uh, because so often like we're get like the parent gets so worked up in the moment too because your kid is hitting and it usually causes chaos and so just knowing like hey the consequences when we hit the action stops right like we're going to stop what we are doing playing the brother not playing the parents walking away I am concerned also about the time out because usually these kids are really craving connection and and that attention. And so by taking it all away, it actually makes the situation worse. And I would encourage you setting up something that's more of like a calm down corner, which is actually a very nice space to go to that has strategies for calming down. And that eventually, if the child calms down, you can join with them. So you're not asking them to leave the family. You're asking them to go somewhere that has the tools that they need. Like when you're angry, what do you want? You don't want to be locked in a separate room, right? You want to go maybe to your room where it feels cozy. You want to go like as an adult, the place that you go to make yourself feel better is usually somewhere that has the things that you like. So I encourage you to when he's calm set up a space called the calm down corner that has some things that help him feel calm and a place that he can invite you into that space I had some of like the best kind of memories snuggles moments in our calm down corner when the kids would calm down and say um, be able to actually ask like what I could use as a hug because sometimes that is what they need is that reconnection with the adult, the parent, the the sometimes even the brother, right? On these terms of uh, of being able to reconcile that relationship um once they're calm. Just going to second the calm down corner. Noah's class kindergarten classroom has that and it works very well and it's also like if your kid's tired like they can just fall asleep there too. It's a it's a very good catch-all corner. Yeah. Teddy actually really liked, he learned like a strategy in occupational therapy, which is something else that I was going to recommend, but hit the strategy um, was called the turtle because he, he would feel so angry that it was like he needed to go inside his own shell and figure it out before he came out. Uh, and that for him was under a table. Like he really liked getting somewhere small where there just wasn't a lot of stimulus. 
Um, and, and there are all these great strategies. If this is becoming a problem, which it clearly sounds like it is, I would really recommend talking to your doctor about whether therapy is appropriate or some kind of occupational therapy. A lot of times the like kids that can't really stop hitting need some help with that, which is what occupational therapists do. It could be sensory related. They could be so sensory overwhelmed that this is the only way they know to kind of try to get control of what they're feeling inside. Um, it, it could be just now that the hitting has become so automatic that you are going to need some assistance in in getting them to stop. So I wouldn't be afraid to tell your pediatrician, hey, this is happening. This is what we're trying. It's not working. Asking them for strategies. Talk to a therapist about do we need a couple family counseling, coaching sessions on how to do with this or even saying like perhaps we need to investigate some kind of, of sensory situation. And I, I think mm-hmm. um, Zach's idea of tracking might really help you get a sense of of what's going on, uh, you know, when the hitting's happening, what's happening around it. For one of our kids, the hitting came when he was, when, when the room got too loud and things just kind of got too sensory overwhelming. Then the next thing that happened, it was like, just this hit. It's like, they didn't know what else to do with that energy. Mm. You know, I co-signed the therapy recommendation, of course. (laughs) I think sometimes people think this is like too like it's a three year old hitting. I don't need therapy, but it's like there there are strategies and getting someone else to help tell your child like it's okay to feel angry and here's what we can do with that anger is really helpful. Yeah. Totally. I also am not sure what you're doing about reconciliation with the family, but I really want to encourage that that not be a demand of an apology. Um, and instead be something that you're, you're working on in the calm periods. Um, and also that you are, you know, demonstrating, I was worried for a long time because the hitting would not necessarily always, you know, lead to these apologies that I thought they needed. Um, and especially at three, sometimes you have to help the child make a good apology, which is not like repeating after. Sometimes it would be um, me doing the apology while giving the hitter kind of a hug. So we've calmed down. I'm like holding them, comforting them and helping them by being their voice, make this apology and helping them see that the apology will be met with a, I still love you because so Often, if that's not happening, I I know it's like somebody got physically hurt in your family and that's bad, but the hitter is also really hurting. They're a three-year-old child. Mm. So helping them see that we can come back from this Mm -hmm. and we can make an apology and we can kind of set the family right, I think is really important. All right, Shell Shock Dad. Thanks for writing in again. Hopefully we gave you some strategies to try. Please send us an update. And if anyone else has advice for Shell Shock Dad, email us at momanddadislate.com. We'll pass it along and we might read it on the show. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise, boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. You can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, 
DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. All right, let's move on to recommendations. This week, we're doing something a little different. Andrea posted in the Slate Parenting Facebook group that her kids have been putting aside a portion of their allowance for the last year for charity, and now it's time to donate. She was looking for advice on charities, so we thought in the spirit of Giving Tuesday, we would all recommend something you could support this holiday season. I love that idea of saving all year and then deciding as a family what to do with the money. It's it's beautiful. I've been doing that with uh, like my sister and, and my dad for the last couple of years, but starting super young is so smart. It's great. Um, okay, I will do the first recommendation. We're still in the midst of this disaster in Israel and Gaza, and it's, it's very hard to find any semblance of hope um, amidst all this destruction and war and violence um, and vengeance. Uh, but there is an organization that I've become really interested in. They're called Standing Together. I don't know if you've heard of them. They uh, there was an article about them in the New York Times this week. You could you can learn more about you can learn more about them from there or go to their website standing together.org. But basically, it's this grassroots movement um, made up of Jewish Israelis and Palestinian citizens of Israel who are sick of the status quo and. Um, kind of can see that the the extremes on either sides are taking the wind out of the sails of of peace and uh this group standing together they've been making a lot of headway and i think i think it's a growing movement i think you'll be hearing more about them if you follow what's happening in the region um but they are here to say no to the occupation and economic injustice and um i find that like looking to the people who are actually living in the place um, that the whole world has their eyes on and and seeing how they are coping in these really imaginative, generative ways is is super hopeful. So standing together is is where I just made started making monthly donations uh, last week. That's wonderful. I think you've, have you posted some stuff? Yeah, I feel I've been, like on I've Instagram, you shared them. some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am recommending one of our favorite charities, which is the Conservation Fund. They, um, work on protecting America's land and water resources by purchasing them, helping communities purchase them. Um, They try to kind of find the place between economic and environmental goals. So understanding that like in a lot of these communities that the natural resources are also what's driving uh, the economy. And so like, how can we protect those? I also really love they are an A plus charity on Charity Watch. So I think it costs them like $2 to raise every $100 or something like that. So there's just not a lot being spent on overhead, which I always love. they also on their site will often post um, or link to like actual projects that you can go do with your family, which I think with kids is so great. Mm-hmm. So yes, of course, um, if you have money to give, it's a great place to donate money. But also if what you have is just a little bit of time, you know, going and helping in these places uh, in in your community can be really helpful. And if you can't do any of that, my recommendation is to just go grab a grab a trash bag, participate in a group cleanup, or just go clean up a natural space near you. You can spend 20 minutes and really clear out some plastics and garbage that are in one of these natural spaces to, to actually, you know, really help. So I know um, uh, if you can't be giving financially, find a way to give with your family of your time mm-hmm. is always a really nice thing to do. Cool. That's great. What about you, Jamila? One of my favorite organizations, I actually used to work with them, is Girls for Gender Equity. They're based in New York City, um, and I'll read their mission statement. 
Girls for Gender Equity works intergenerationally through a Black feminist lens to center the leadership of Black girls and gender expansive young people of color in reshaping culture and policy through advocacy, youth-centered programming, and narrative shift to achieve gender and racial justice. So they do policy work in terms of advocating to elected officials to make changes on behalf of Black girls um, and other young people in New York City. They successfully lobbied uh, a couple Couple years ago to increase the number of Title uh, IX officers in New York City from one. There was one Title IX officer oh serving 1.1 million New York City public school students. So that means one person Shoot. responsible for every allegation of sexual harassment or rape, every pregnant student, every sports program, making sure that there is equity for boys and girls. Um, to I think they increased it to 12. Um, it's an amazing organization. They allow young people to be part of the planning and the building. They do direct service. So they have after school programs and leadership groups for young people. They train them in becoming politically active and aware. They help them develop, you know, policy suggestions and, you know, interventions that work. And, you know, they're working to end gender-based violence uh, against Black girls and all girls. It's a really amazing organization. Cool. That's great. All right. Finally, we want to share some of the amazing notes and letters that you all have been sending us. Yes. Well, oh, my goodness. Um, people, Jamila really co-signed your cornbread <laughs> recommendation. I feel like uh, there might have been a, a jiffy bump in the last <laughs> few weeks just from you, not, you know, regardless of Thanksgiving. But um, Alan and Elizabeth, not, not me, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, our lovely listener, mentioned that they actually add creamed corn into the mix to give it a little something extra. Um, I also got tagged on on X by a listener, uh, Jane Halton, who said, Hey, Mu Zachary, have you tried tamale pie? All your cornbread dreams, but a whole meal. Did you know what tamale pie is? I had never heard of it. I've heard of it, but I've never had it. I'll read what Jane said. I've just used whatever chili recipe you like, and then I pour that into a casserole dish and top it off with cornbread batter and bake per the cornbread directions. Um, so it's chili and cornbread. Um, sitting in a tree together it sounds really good mm -hmm. what did you do zach sent me <laughs> a tower yeah yeah after last week's episode i went out and got six packages we were doing a friendsgiving last shabbat last friday night and i made uh corn muffins just classic um just the jiffy the jiffy mix plus milk can't go wrong yeah <sighs> Okay, our next letter has some advice for you, Elizabeth. You know how a few weeks ago you were complaining about the boy's inability to use chopsticks? Well, when Amy's daughter was little, her friend from Taiwan created a device to help her learn. She rubber-banded two chopsticks together with a folded napkin in between, which essentially creates a lever that kids can operate while they build finger dexterity. I've seen this before. It, I think it's a really good idea. Do you think your kids would buy in? I had to, I had to Google it to figure out exactly how to fold the napkin. I read the letter. I went downstairs, <laughs> tried to do it. Was like, okay, hold on. Um, but we are we are trying this, and I am gonna put a few rubber bands in my bag so that at the restaurant, um, I can I can try to make one of these on the go and see if it helps. I think they also make like pre made ones. Have you seen those? We have. Um, like a training one that has with the finger placement, which is fine at the house, right? Like w what I liked about this is that my issue is more when we're out because at the house I have the training ones and if they make a mess, it's not a big deal. But if we're like at a restaurant and all they have is chopsticks, <laughs> we're, you know, there's not a lot I can do. So this feels like yeah. something I can do in the moment. Don't get it. Our last letter is actually a voicemail from listener Gretchen. Hi, Mom and Dad. This message is in regard to the listener whose 10-month-old baby is on the move and who just needs some rest. Great advice on the show. I have one more build. Is this the opportunity to source out a local middle school student who just loves babies and hire them for an hour after school each day? This would allow you to attend to other household needs or simply sit down and zone out. 
You're still in the house with an eye and an ear available, but are not the one fully and actively responsible directly for baby during that time. Additionally, do you have a community fitness center or a local YMCA that can provide child care while you use the facility? Nobody says you have to be on the treadmill. Sitting and chilling in the locker room is fully encouraged. Even just an hour can do so much when you are that exhausted. Hope you get the rest you deserve, Mom. Love the show. That's really... I These are that. great yeah. ideas. I I got my babysitting start as a, like, we called the mother's helper. So you're not, a, you're just there with the kids so parents can get something else done. Yeah. I feel like not only was it a great opportunity for the parent, but a really good opportunity for me to learn to babysit, like, and to be responsible with, like, very low stakes because the parents were still in the house. Um, I, I just, like, felt relief just, just by imagining you hiring a babysitter for an hour. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for writing in or leaving us a voicemail. We always love hearing from you. You can reach us at mom and dad at slate.com or at 646-357-9318. Before we go, we need your help. We're preparing the annual mom and dad are fighting holiday party episode. It's a lot of fun. We even wrangle the kids on the mic. Send us your questions for our kids. Email us at momanddad at slate.com or call it in to 646-357-9318. Thank you so much in advance. We've had some like kids call in with uh, questions for our kids. I'm so yes. excited. <laughs> Very cute. So keep them coming. Please keep them coming. And that's our show. Please subscribe, leave a rating and review, and tell your friends. This episode of Mom and Dad are Fighting is produced by Rosemary Belson and Mara Curry. Shasha Leonard is the voice of our listeners. Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Slate Audio. For Zach Rosen and Elizabeth Newcamp, I'm Jamila Lemire. Thanks for listening.